Hello, welcome to this uh, Google Hangout with Reverend William Barber II from Moral Mondays and the NAACP in North Carolina. This is Lisa Sharon Harper coming to you from Sojourners, and we are so happy that you're joining us today. Um, Dr. William Barber uh, II is the president of North Carolina AA NAACP and convener of the historic Thousands on Jones Street um, People's Assembly Coalition a broad alliance of more than 140 progressive organizations and the architect of North Carolina's Moral Monday, Forward Together Movement, a multiracial, multigenerational social justice movement of tens of thousands. Reverend Dr. Um, William Barber is also a member of the National AACP Board and Chair of the National AACP, NAACP and Legislative Political Action Committee. Um, Dr. Barber is also the author of several books, including um, his most recent book, which we're going to be talking about today, Forward Together, A Moral Message for the Nation. And he's been featured in the Wall Street Journal and uh, uh, CNN, MSNBC. I'm sure that you've seen him in lots of different places, um, Crisis Magazine, New York Times, and the list goes on. Um, and Dr. Barber lives in Greenber Green Goldsboro, North Carolina, where uh, for over 20 years, he has pastored at Greenleaf Christian Church. And so today, we're really going to be talking with Dr. Barber about his book, Forward Together. But we want to get reflections from him, not only on the book, but also you know, linking that to what's going on in the world around us. We have so much going on in our world. We have the Black Lives Matter movement, I Can't Breathe in New York City. Um, we have uh, issues with climate change and and uh, cl um, global warming. We've just seen recently that uh, this last year was the warmest year on record. And we have um, issues with health care and Medicare expansions, Medicaid expansions um, that are being denied in states, including his own. And so we're going to be talking with him. And, and then the, you, the viewer, will have an opportunity to ask questions in the second half of our broadcast. And I just want to share with you that this, this time, our time together, is coming to you from Sojourners Faith in Action and so I want to take a little moment before we begin to give a little blurb, little little shout out uh, to Sojourners Faith in Action. So join the inner circle and become a leader. Um, join the leader circle for Sojourners Faith in Action and what that means is that you get a bunch of stuff, um, you get a lot of discounts in our store, uh, you get uh, first dibs at asking questions at things like this, at um, hangouts like this. And you can do it by um, emailing mobilizing at sojo.net, mobilizing at sojo.net for more information. So with that said, let's begin. Let's begin our broadcast. So Dr. Barber, would you please tell us um, what is it that you, that, that really um, started you on your path? Uh, you know, I actually, I w we were talking before we went live here and, and I was sharing with you that I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by the blend, the very strong blend in your leadership and preaching uh, of history and law and scripture. And I'm just wondering, what made you? Like, how did that happen? What's your story? Well, first of all, thank you, Lisa. Let me thank Sojourners and, and, and all the work that you do. Um, Absolutely. And, and the partnership. I was born August 30th, 1963 two days after the March on Washington. The joke in my family is that um, I decided to wait a couple of days to see what those persons that were claiming they were going to march on Washington were really going to do. Uh, my mother went into labor on the 28th and stopped. Um, but I say that because I think it had an impact on me. Well, what I mean by that is my parents, uh, post that march, received a call, my father did, to come back to eastern North Carolina to give up his career in Indianapolis, Indiana, and to help integrate public schools. And they decide, they made a, a decision to take their only child away from Indianapolis, Indiana, where they had already begun desegregation, go back to the South, which was my, my father's um, home, put me in segregated public schools in 1967 hmm. so that I could be a part of uh, integrating public schools in 1970, which was 16 years after Brown. My father became one of the first uh, uh, science teachers, and my mother was the first secretary of the high school. My point being that my father taught me very early on 
that there was no that to be Christian was to be concerned about justice. Mm -hmm. And that theological framing helped to form me. Uh, I got involved in NAACP early on. I went to North Carolina Central University, majored in political science and public administration. Mm -hmm. Thought that I was go I was going to go a lot to go to law school. I got a serious call to ministry, went to Duke, did a Master of Divinity, and then later on did a, a, a doctorate uh, of ministry at Drew University. But my focus is on public care, public policy, and pastoral care. Hmm. And with a, a merging to say there's no way you can be concerned pastorally about the congregants in which you pastor without being concerned about the policies and the decisions that impact their daily lives. Um, and so in a real sense, it was the merging of, it was through my family, it was through my early training, uh, both undergrad and in graduate school, uh, that, that this formation. Finally, I pastor. And one of the things is that every, no matter where I march, whether it's in Raleigh or Ferguson, every Sunday I have to come back and look in the faces of people. People who are impacted because of denial of Medicaid. People are impacted because their children are lack of public education. People who are losing or denied or bridged their rights to vote. People whose children or other persons are involved in the unfairness of our criminal justice system. So it's very real for me. I have to pastor mm -hmm. a diverse congregation. And I don't know how to do that and be a follower of Christ or my Jewish friends a follower of Moses. Uh, uh, and not be concerned about uh, the public square. So wait, so I have a question for you here. I'm going to kind of break in. I just recently had a conversation with someone who was talking about how hard it is in their area um, to get pastors sometimes, and we're talking African-American clergy uh, in, in and around southern cities, midwestern cities in particular. Those were really kind of the concept we were talking about to actually take action in the same way that you are or in, and other pastors in the Forward Together movement. Where does that come from? I mean, I, and that's that's kind of foreign to me because my my concept of of the black church is, in, especially in the South, has been largely shaped by um, by by the civil rights movement. So, is there is there a, a, a historical root of inaction in the in the historic black church or even in black evangelical churches? Where does that come from? Well, I think there's a there's a has, has been a historic inaction in church period. You know, um, well, <laughs> in, in my, yeah, in my in, in my dissertation that I wrote, I I, I quoted um, how for years in this country, people uh -huh. interpreted Luke four eighteen as meaning private, you know, private salvation, private, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what. Jesus meant when he talked about preaching good news to the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that we have these kairos moments that, that, that draw us out. For instance, the slave preacher was drawn out because of the injustice of slavery. Dr. King didn't go to Montgomery to be the surprise leader, but the moment Mark Rosa Parks' action thrust upon him to be both a preacher in the church and a preacher in the public square, and he challenged his members likewise. He never stopped being involved as a pastor. So it is in this movement. The wow. pastors and rabbis that have come in have come in because the extremist attacks on everything from health care to voting rights to public education have forced us to have one or two options. Be at ease in Zion and be held accountable for being at ease and not raising our moral voices or being engaged. And so now we've had over a thousand clergy of different faiths to say, I'm going to choose the latter option, and that is to be engaged. So, so what? This is interesting. So, what you're saying is that, or what I'm hearing is that, uh, for many clergy that finally actually get activated, it's really because they've been pushed because injustice has come up in their face, and they have to confront it. Is that well? Is that that's, what you're yeah, and that's true biblically. The prophets yeah. never arose until the priests and the kings weren't doing their job. The the moment pushed in the day in the year that Uzziah died. All right. You know uh -huh. Jeremiah is Jeremiah is thrust into his role because of Hananiah's false prophecy that is causing destruction. So so in a real sense, yes, we, we are trained. Sadly, I think in seminaries to do two of the three things we ought to be doing. 
priestly and pastoral. Mm -hmm. We are we but what but but we are pushed into doing that third thing, which is the prophetic ministry. Which in fact I believe my personally that you need the priestly part, the, the prayer life, the, the and the pastoral part and and the intense involvement with the people in mm -hmm. order to properly do the prophetic part. And and I think it's a very humbling thing to do the prophetic. Nobody likes to question your state. As Dr. Mm -hmm. King once said, or question your country. You don't. Nobody enjoys standing up and being and, and critic, and then because you're a critic, having forces come at you and lie on you and threaten you. And I've had death threats and all that. But the moment demands. The moment demands. Amos six. Woe unto those who are at ease mm -hmm. in Zion. The moment demands that we not be at ease. Wow, so this is interesting. So you talk about the moment, and in your book, in the both in the welcome and the introduction, and and even in the structure, the whole structure of the book, forward together, um, it it is it it stresses the whole book stresses the context of your movement, of 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 the Moral Mondays Forward Together movement, and I so I wanted to ask if you could actually share why why did you well it seems like you kind of have already kind of gone into like why that's important but share a little bit more about what that context is so that we'll have more of an understanding of what the Moral Mondays movement has become. Well, let me do it this way exegetically, if I mm -hmm. might. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't understand Moses without the context of Pharaoh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and you don't understand Moses. Yes. The, the, every, every prophetic book opens with uh, "in the days of Amaziah" or "in the days of so." So that the context is critical, uh, even with 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 um, uh, Jesus. You don't understand his first sermon, Luke four eighteen, where he says, "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor." if you don't understand who the poor were in that day and why Luke chooses this word patokos, which means those being made poor, if you don't understand the context of Roman society and the, and the, and the, and the inequalities and the discrimination and the, and the uh, um, 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 way in which the 1% in that day were ruling over the 99, then you miss the whole the exegetical point. Wow. Um, my dad used to say Jesus did. You know, Jesus basically did miracles based on what he found in the historical context. So, it is critical to understand history in order to understand how to move in history. Mm. Now, if you look at today the attacks we're seeing, and you go back to the 19th century, 1868, when black and brown, black and white people fused into South after slavery to build a new South and a new America. What what things did they first decide they were going to change? Constitutions at the state level to be fair. To, they were going to uh, make education constitutional right, voting a constitutional right, uh, labor. Uh, some labor laws uh, were going to be written in such a way that they were anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. And 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 most of them did that with at least within about three years. From 19, 1872 to 1898, there was a backlash to deconstruct Reconstruction. What did that backlash do? First, they attacked voting rights. Then they attacked the courts. Then they attacked fair tax systems. Then they attacked public education. And then they attacked the very leaders that were moving the country forward. And, and by 1898, with riots in Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, the, the first Reconstruction was over. Second Reconstruction, 1954, Brown decision. What do we see happening? Opening up public education, ending um, um, a separate but equal, focusing on voting rights. You know, Dr. King's first march on Washington was the prayer vigil in 1957, where he talked about give us the ballot. That's he right. talked about economic justice in one of his first sermons at Dexter in 1956 before he ever went to the March on Washington. We get all of this massive change. Then what happens? Around 1968, 14 years after the beginning of the Second Reconstruction, you get the white Southern strategy. What does that strategy attack? Voting rights, tries to restructure the court, attacks union, attacks all of the programs that uh, that were popular when they benefited white people in the 30s and 40s, but now suddenly, as soon as brown and black people begin to get access, all of a sudden they become bad things. So wait, can My you just, is, I'm sorry, real quick, can you just explain yeah. the white southern strategy? Because I'm not sure that all of our viewers will know what that is. Well, everybody needs to Google Lee Atwater's tape on the white southern strategy, where basically Kevin Phillips, the operative for Richard Nixon, 
uh, came to him at, with some advice of, of George Wallace and said, we've got to stop using race words. We've got to come up with code words that, that, that sound racially neutral but will cause Southern whites and working whites to be against black people um, and, and to undermine the, the black and white coalitions in the South that can, that, 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 that can make this country progress. So they decided they wouldn't talk about race. They wouldn't use the N-word. Instead, they would talk about tax cuts, neighborhood schools, forced busing, um, states' rights. Sounds racially neutral. And Lee Atwater actually said, it sounds racially neutral, but the end result is it hurts black people more than whites, and it causes certain Southern whites to see black people and brown people as their enemy. Now, yeah. what I'm saying is when you look at what ended the first two reconstructions, and you look at the attacks happening today, the attack on voting rights, the attack on health care, the attack on labor, the limited moral view of the so-called extremists, where they say the only issues we ought to be concerned about are abortion, homosexuality, prayer in the school, the, the attack on fair tax policies. The question becomes, are we in the, uh, 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 do extremists see the possibility of a third reconstruction? And this time, rather than allowing it to take root like it did in the 19th century and root like it did in the 20th century, they're trying to abort it on the front end. Hmm. Like, wow. like, like, just like, just like Pharaoh told the midwives, don't let those babies be born. I believe that the election of President Obama, not President Obama, the electorate that was broad and deep and hopeful and, and, and fundamentally shifted, began to shift demographics in the South, was a sign to many people who want to hold on to the Southern strategy, the solid South, we better do something. And we can't wait like we did in the 19th century, in the 20th century. We better begin right now. So what do you see? As soon as he gets elected, as soon as that electorate changes the country, mm -hmm. the attack on voting rights, the attack by the courts, the attack on public education, the attack on labor rights, all of these things, which in the first two reconstructions were done on the back end. Mm -hmm. But this time it's being done on the front end, which is why we believe we are in the embryonic stages of a third reconstruction, which is why all of these movements from Marl Monday to I Can't Breathe to Hands Up and to the fast food workers are merging now because there's a birthing that's trying to come forth those who know history on the extremist side see it just like we ought to see it. Wow. And they're trying to abort it. So now, but so you talk about fusion politics. Can you, what is that? It sounds like that has a lot to do with your strategy in this context. Well, it's fusion in terms of, of agenda and in terms of, 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 of people and forces brought together. Mm -hmm. By fusion, and, and here we mean that the Forward Together Moral Monday, this is how we describe it. It is an indigenously led, state-focused, and I'll talk about why state-focused, mm -hmm. uh, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racist, you got to deal with racism, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor, transformative fusion coalition which means you, you find a language that's not Democrat-Republican, not liberal versus conservative, which moral language gives you that framework mm -hmm. that can cause people to go deeper mm -hmm. into who we are as human beings, not just african American. And you fuse the agenda and you begin to show people that the same people are fighting public education are the same people fighting criminal justice reform. And the same people fighting criminal justice reform or the forces are the same people fighting to fighting voting rights. And the same people fighting against voting rights are the same people fighting LGBT rights and women's rights. And the same people fighting those are fighting environmental rights. If they are cynical enough to be to get, to 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 to, um, to uh, be, come together, be together, we ought to be smart enough, wise enough to come together. Hmm. That's the point. And you fuse, rather than everybody working on their individual agendas, you begin to recognize the power that we have together. In the 19th century, when blacks and whites came together in the South, mm -hmm. they fundamentally changed the South and changed the nation. In the civil rights movement, when, when brown people and white people and black people and labor and churches came together, fusion, they fundamentally changed the nation. And that's what we mean. And we believe it has to happen at the state level from the bottom up because most of our challenges of extremism is happening in our state capitals. Mm 
So now you say they came together in the 19th century. When did that happen? It came together right after slavery, after the after the end of slavery. Mm -hmm. For instance, in, in, in 10 southern states mm -hmm. after slavery were virtually controlled by either majority black uh, General Assembly state bodies or strong black Republican at the time, Lincoln Republican coalitions. Mm -hmm. And those fusion coalitions, the first thing they did was they rewrote constitutions. And interestingly enough, they used deep moral language. Like, for instance, in, in, in our constitution in 1868, a preacher named J.W. Hood, who would later be the bishop of the AME Zion Church, and mm -hmm. Samuel Ashley, who was a congregation, who was a white Republican, came together. And they crafted the preamble. And this is what they said. We hold it to be self-evident that all persons, not men, are created equal. Wow. Endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. They made public education a constitutional right in Article 1. They wrote into the Constitution, based on their deep moral values, uh, equal protection under the law before the 14th Amendment was ever passed in the federal wow. constitution. And in Article 11, Section 4, this is what they said in 1868, fusing. They said, um, a beneficent provision to the poor, to the orphan, and to the unfortunate is the first duty of a civilized and Christian state. That's 1868. Wow. What? And we are, we, yeah, we are using what they wrote in 1868 to sue North Carolina today. Well, thank you, Mr. Hood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And thank you. Thank you to our white ally that we had out there um, right. in 1868. And, 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 all, if you, and, and that's part of what we've got to do is, you know, it's not as though people have not worked together. We've not lifted up this history. And people almost want to hide it. Mm -hmm. There was this whole period of time from, you know, that, that you saw tremendous change uh, mm -hmm. in this country. And the same thing with the civil rights movement, where you saw this coming together. In the movie Selma, there's a point where Dr. King invites everybody to come. Yeah. And you see this marvelous fusion of people from mm -hmm. labor to Catholics to Eastern Orthodox to Muslim, you know, to black to white coming together. And, 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 the, and, and the reality is that fusion is what extremists are afraid of because they know if people wake up and come together, extremism is pushed to the margins. It really is. Hmm. So I want to ask you about a concept that you talk about in your book about bearing witness. Um, you talk about protest as bearing witness. In fact, I think it was in the opening of chapter one. Um, you actually say, it says, we, you, 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 you have this quote, we know who we are. We know we are called to bear witness at this moment of history. We have faith there is a better way for North Carolina. There is a better way for America. There is a better way for our world. We mobilize for a better way. And the, the point of that chapter is actually about how we have to know who we are before we enter the public square. And we enter the public square in order to bear witness, um, a prophetic witness. So can you just talk about, and this is really kind of an educational point for people who are not that familiar with protests. They might be, they might have actually gone out and joined a, a, a Black Lives Matter or I Can't Breathe protest, but they don't really know the function of protest in the church tradition, in our faith tradition, and also how it functions in the public square. Yeah, and and, and, and long-term committed process. It doesn't simply... Yeah say, I'm going to do this because I know I can win. Uh, actually, I'm going to do it because we must change the wins, the W-I-N-D-S uh, yeah. uh, uh, of, uh, of the times. Yeah, yeah Lisa, you know, um, you must know who you are. We, we, when we decided to start Moral Monday, in fact, this is part of a larger movement that's been going on now for nine years. Moral Monday is just an evolution of the movement, but we've been battling, even when Democrats went office, we've been nonpartisan. But we said in 2007 we needed to inject a new ethic into the politics of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. An ethic that was rooted in our deepest moral values, our deepest constitutional values, mm -hmm. an ethic that, that examined public policy along these lines. 
these lines. Is it constitutionally consistent? Is it morally defensible? And is it economically sane? Um, mm -hmm. we, we believe, as, as a people, that, as deeply moral people, that the cries of our brothers and sisters and how we treat the poor and how we treat the least of these are not supposed to be at the margins of public debate, but at the center. Our Constitution says that, our federal Constitution says the first principle of freedom is the establishment of justice. It is not private ownership. <laughs> well. it, it is not gun ownership. <laughs> It is not how okay. many people you can discriminate against. It is the establishment of justice. Wow. Having said that, we are commanded both by our faith and our constitution. Because some people are in this because of faith, and some people are in it because of human reason, some in the constitution, and some all three. We are commanded to register our discontent. The mm -hmm. constitution says that when it gets, we are commanded to register our discontent. Mm -hmm. Now, registering discontent must mean more than a tweet. <laughs> it may Amen. be a tweet sometimes. There must be a public witness. So, for instance, Moses had to go to Pharaoh and say, "Let my people go." Uh huh. Uh, uh, Jeremiah twenty-two says, "Go down to the palace. Don't send a message, and tell the king uh -huh. that in this place, in this seat of government, there's not supposed to be oppression and and killing of the innocent and hurting of the truth." As the, 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 the uh, hurt, hurting of the children. Isaiah 10 says, Woe unto those who legislate evil. Who legislate evil. It says that. And rob the poor of their right. Jesus says, Take up your cross in public and follow me. So there is a, there is a place at which when you try to negotiate and people don't listen, when you point out their, their inconsistency with our Constitution, our deepest moral value, and they refuse you, then you are required to put your body on the line and go public. That's why more than a thousand people in North Carolina, more than any time in history, were arrested. When the officer said, if you don't leave, we're going to arrest you, we said, we can't leave. Yeah. To, to leave would be to to deny ourselves, to deny our deepest moral values, to deny our constitution. We said, you can arrest us if you want so desire, but we can't stop protesting. Mm -hmm. We can't stop. And interesting enough, recently, Lisa, a judge threw out 960 of the cases and said, that's exactly right. Not only should you not have left, you didn't have to leave. Wow. Wow. You didn't have to leave. Right? Yeah. I understand that. In fact, it's funny. I have a friend who um, is, is actually a few friends in St. Louis who are leading evangelicals there, and they recently had a bout with some threats to their Martin Luther King weekend mm -hmm. um, uh, protest, and they were going to be marching and shutting down Shaw Avenue, and they had that conversation. They they actually realized, you know, they were they were facing the same kind of danger that um, protesters that sure. your protesters faced, that, that they did in Selma, um, and, I mean, really, threats to their lives, and they realized sure. there's no way that they could turn back. They had, they had to bear witness. Yeah, a, light, a, light, a light has no place under a bushel. It's yeah. a very prayerful thing. You don't do it in hate. You don't mm -hmm. do it with anger. I mean, you have anger, but legitimate, righteous anger. But I'm talking about you don't mad. You know, I tell people the difference between anger and being mad is anger is and grief. You are mourning over the over the problem, over the injustice. Mad is something where you just do anything. <sighs> but but you you bear you bear witness. Uh, you bear the cross. You 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 step, and it has to be done in the public square. Uh -huh. Not simply in the safe place of the pulpit, but, it, it, you know, you preach in the pulpit, but then, as, as Jim Forbes says in his book, Preaching in the Holy Spirit, prophets believe the words declared on Sunday will become alive on Monday. They, they take on flesh. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be willing to stand up in places of power and say, guess what? There's another power. There's another force. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg did that on June 23rd when the when the Supreme Court overturned the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Look at yeah. what she said. She she went from being a Supreme Court justice to a prophetess, if it's my true. they would say in my tradition. She said <laughs> she went through all of the law, and then she said, "But 
the real word for what you have done is hubris. Now, you know, Proverbs said pride comes before the fall. She said it's hubris. Then she said, in essence, no matter what you've done, remember Bloody Sunday. And Ooh. remember, and she said this to she the did. Supreme That's Court right. justices who sometimes think they are supreme. In essence, she said, there's a, there's a higher, higher law, there's a higher power above us. She said, and she looked at every one of them and said, the moral arc of the universe may be long, but it will bend toward justice. Wow. She was preaching in the public square from the bench. And so we believe that you have to engage uh, in the public square with both. And, but the witness now, let me say this quickly. Mm -hmm. The protest must have an agenda basis. You can't just scream at the darkness. The protest must be to, to help shift the consciousness of the people. So, for instance, when we started in the Forward Together Moral Monday movement, Less than 40% of the people in North Carolina believe that there ought to be Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. But when we, in a nonviolent way, consistently, we've been at this now over 149 weeks, and the first thing, the first a part of Mormons was 14 straight weeks. People, first they said, oh, they're just acting out. This is going to be over. And they kept coming back. And then every day before we went in, we taught the media. We said, this is why we're here. 500,000 people being denied Medicaid, uh, 2,800 people will die. People who were dying came to the mic and said, I'm going in to be arrested because I'm not a Doctors went in and said, I must be public in my witness because my patients are being harmed. And you know now 60% of North Carolinians say, you're right. We should be wow. expanding Medicaid. You should be expanding Medicaid. So huh. public witnesses is not just about advocating for people. We had black, we had white, we had young, we had old, we had brown, we had uh, Asian, we had gay, we had straight, we had doctors, we had sick people, we had insured people, uninsured people, the homeless, the unemployed, the, the job makers, the business brokers, all who came because of conscience and said we can do better. And, 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 and that public witness began to reshape consciousness. Okay, so I'm going to actually ask folks who are watching to go ahead and send in your questions now. We have one more question that I'll ask, and then while I'm asking this question, if you guys could go ahead and send in your questions using the Q&A function on the Google Hangout, or if, if you can't use that, which some people won't be able to use, uh, I believe if you're not logged in through Google, um, but if, if you can't use that, go ahead and, and send in your questions using Sojo Action, hashtag Sojo Action. Um, so, so last question before we get to the viewers' questions. You talk about the need to define who you are, mm -hmm. um, and and actually, this will get a little bit to um to what one of the one of the um, viewers has asked. You know, what questions do we have to answer for our our movements today? Um, in order to be able to understand our own identity and that self-defining process, what do we have to nail down to know who we are? Well, let me see if I can answer this in, in this way. In the movie Selma, there's a scene where Dr. King is laying on the couch and he says, what do we really want? Uh -huh. And they wrestle with that. You know, we can't, it's not just we want to get in their face. Right. But what is it that we want? And we want and we must make sure that our narrative goes out. For instance, there are a lot of times, I used to study how Dr. King, when he did press conferences, was always very calm and focused in his voice because he didn't want people to see him you know, with the eyebrows up. He wanted the message. Mm -hmm. He understood when he was before those cameras, he was talking to millions of people. And he didn't want to just say the system was bad. He wanted to offer them the other piece. So you have to tie down what is it that your deepest moral values and deepest constitutional values demand ought to be done. Mm -hmm. See, you got to know what ought to be done in order to know what's wrong. In other words, mm -hmm. in other words, you have to know what is moral and what is right to know what is immoral and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things we did is even before we had extremism in North Carolina, I want to read, this is from page 160. We knew what our agenda, we've been fighting for this agenda, not just this past year when the extremists took over, but even when Democrats went over. We said, number one, we want, we are pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that create economic sustainability by fighting for full employment, living wages, the alleviation of despair unemployment, a green economy, labor rights, affordable housing, 
targeted the empowerment zone, strong safety nets for the poor, fair policies for immigrants, infrastructure, and fair policy tax reform. Mm -hmm. We want educational equality for every child, a constitutional education, diverse public education. We want health care for all by, by access to the Affordable Care Act as a beginning. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and Environmental Protection. We want fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the continuing inequalities in the system as it pertains to blacks, brown people, and poor whites. And we want to protect and expand voting rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, immigrant rights, and the fundamental principle of equal protection under the law. That's, we define what we want with there clear you know. action steps, which then allows us to critique the policy. Mm -hmm. Just to say the policy is bad is not enough. The, the prophetic role, the prophet must, the prophetic role, the moral prophetic role is you must critique the policy. You must then show if this policy continues how it's going to be damaging and damning to the whole nation. But then you must offer hope. You must offer an agenda. So I preached in Duke Chapel this past Sunday, call to be positioned as powerful prisoners of prophetic hope, Zechariah 9, 11, and 12, where it says, return to your fortresses, you prisoners of hope. So, so we believe you've got to know what is moral. You've, you have to come to the table with an agenda mm -hmm. so that you have something to a challenge the agenda of extremism. And I think, but I, here's the thing, I think that also in today's, I know that this is absolutely true in today's movement, that that in along with the list of demands which you have to have, you have to be clear on your strategy in terms of whether or not you are going to embrace nonviolence or not, and what does nonviolence mean to you, or you know basically at least at the very least in terms of your strategy. So what would you say to that? Because I know that's a huge question out there right now. Well, the, and the steps of nonviolence. So we have twelve yeah. steps. Okay. And twelve. Twelve. Number one, we believe you have to engage indigenously-led grassroots organizing in the state. Number two, use moral language to frame and critique public policy based on our deepest moral and con constitutional values, not based on who's in power and not based on them looking and saying, what can we get from them? The question is, what is right? Number three, demonstrate a commitment to civil disobedience that follows the steps of civil disobedience. Number four, build a stage from which everyday people speak, not politicians and not people merely speaking on folks' behalf. Five, build a coalition of moral religious leaders. Number six, intentionally diversify the movement. So we have Republicans in our movement. We go into the very areas that they think are strongholds for extremism and, we, and people come with us. Number wow. seven, build, build a long-term relationship rooted in the agenda, not just in a personality. So I may be the point person in some ways, but our coalition is deeply rooted in the agenda. Number eight, make a serious commitment to academic and empirical analysis of policy because the worst thing you want to be is loud and wrong. Mm. Number nine, use social media in all of its terms and the cultural arts. Number 10, engage in voter registration and voter education because if you're concerned about criminal justice it's reform, you have to be concerned about voter registration voter education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number 11, pursue a law, strong legal strategy because whatever you stir up in the street, you wanted to get in the courts to be challenged and examined under, our, under the lens of our Constitution. And lastly, resist the one moment mentality. We need a movement, not a moment. Amen. So now we're going we're gonna to transition into our questions. We have a lot of questions coming in from viewers. Before we do that, I want to just take a little station break to remind us that this is brought to you by Faith in Action. And that is the Leader Circle. If you want to join Sojourner's Faith in Action Leader Circle, uh, this is really the inside scoop here at Sojourner's. Uh, you get a chance to, um, to join in lots of conversations like this. You get the first scoop on uh, Hangout questions, and you also get a lot of discounts. You can find out more by uh, emailing mobilizing at sojo.net. And that's the leader circle, if you can see that. Yeah, there you go. All right, so great, great questions that are coming in. Um, I'm going to go down the uh -oh. list. There's actually one. <laughs> no, they're good. They're good. There's one that actually has several people that have checked. In other words, like a lot of people are saying, yeah, 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 ask this question. 
Okay. Um, so this one comes from Deanna Williams. Deanna asks, I am an agnostic who is greatly inspired by you and the Moral Mondays movement. Do you have a special message for us, the agnostics, atheists, free thinkers, and humanists who are inspired to work with the faith community for social justice? Hmm. Well, I told Bill Nye I was an atheist too, and he said, what are you talking about, preacher? I said, well, I'm an atheist when it comes to the folk that want to suggest to me that God is a bigot and on the side of the, the, the powerful and uh, that, that oppress, and I, I don't believe in that God either. But, but again, listen, in the moral movement, which is why the language is important, some people come in because of their deep moral tradition out of their faith. Some come in because of the deep moral tradition of the Constitution. Some come in because of their deep Faith, understand of human reason. Some come for all three. So we that that there is an embracing of of everybody in that sense. Uh, the question is, can we agree that addressing poverty and economic suspension is a deeply moral issue? However, you get there, the movement is not trying to evangelize people to a particular faith. We're trying to welcome people into a big movement with mm -hmm. deep moral a movement that's bigger than just Democrat. See, this language of left versus right, Democrat versus Republican is too puny. It gets us trapped. It doesn't allow, if I say this is a Democratic position, then it automatically pushes out somebody who may be Republican, but may very well come with me if I'm not framing this in one particular partisan way. So we have persons of, 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 of faith, people not of faith, who are very much engaged and respectful of each other. Okay, so this, thank you so much. This actually comes to us from Jessica Turner, who says, I'm heavily involved in organizing and activism in, Al in Atlanta. While I think protesting and actions have a place, what have you done to change the laws and policy? Do you have any advice for changing policy and laws? Oh, sure. One of the reasons we attack, one of the reasons the extremists attack uh, uh, North Carolina in 2012, and understand how they got into office in 2010, they cheated. They wrote the worst redistricting plan we've seen since the 19th century. The governor could not veto it, and the U.S. Justice Department did not come in and say it was a violation of Section 5. Mm -hmm. um, so, so actually, in our state, we were winning. We, we, we were passing, we, we made policy in education, in expanding voting rights, in health care, the extremists took over after this redistricting. 120,000 more people voted for progressives, and yet we ended up with a, almost a veto-proof, um, well, in fact, a veto-proof General Assembly. And we're battling back because of our successes. Now we've, we're winning in the courts. We've just uh, three things that they passed. We beat them in the courts. The courts said it's unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're in court challenging all of the voter suppression. Uh, but but let me say protest. The reason the protest is important because there's a, there must be a stage in order to build the consciousness and the understanding of the people. Because as Brueggemann says, at Im imagination must precede implementation. Mm -hmm. Folk have to imagine a different way and see what's going on in order to implement. So, so, so yes, we are working on policy, and we don't just protest. We put 37 young people into 40 two counties this past summer doing Freedom Summer. Instead of simply doing a seminar on Freedom Summer, we reenacted it. Hmm. We reenacted it. Again, we've been at these 150 straight weeks. So you might see the big protest in Raleigh, but what you don't see is all of the organizing going on around the state and now in other states. We're building local people's assemblies that are going to challenge these legislators in their districts. So we are fighting in the courts. We're getting ready to roll out a call for a constitutional amendment to raise minimum wage and index it with inflation uh, that we're going to challenge both sides of the aisle to push. We, we, we are, we're getting ready to hold, I told you about this, Lisa, a mm -hmm. people's grand jury on the denial of Medicaid expansion. Wow. And we have former judges and lawyers that are going to form a panel to look at how we can sue these legislators based on the Constitution and also based on wrongful death claims because 1,500 to 2,800 people are dying because of denial. So it's not an either or, it's a both and. That's right. why I would encourage people to read our book and, and go to page 162 and look at the 12-point strategy so that they understand it's not just marching. The yeah. marching is a part of a larger movement, and the marching has its place because we're doing all of the other organizing. 
That's excellent. And we actually have, we have quite a few questions coming in, and, and I want to encourage others, please do go ahead and, and send them in. We have a few more minutes, and we'd like to get as many as possible in. So uh, there's, there's a few. We're going to try to get through all of these. Um, Jenna B. asks, uh, if Jesus performed miracles based on his context and who the poor were back then, what miracles would Jesus be performing today? I like that. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, because yeah. Because it always, it always amazes me that you have these extremists. And notice I don't call them Republicans who love to claim I'm a Christian. And they make a big deal about putting their hand on a Bible when they swear themselves into office. And, you know, the first time I got arrested was simply asking in the legislature, what doth the Lord require and what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. And they arrested seven of us for asking that question. Wow. And the reason is because it's, it's counterintuitive. It's, 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 it's paradoxical, if you will. For, for you, on the one hand, to say you believe in Jesus who gave everybody free health care. And then you turn around and be against health care. Whoa, that's one way to put it. <laughs> so, wow. so, 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 if and if you read Jesus's first sermon, let me let me do a little exegesis. There are three words for poor. The word that Luke uses in Luke four eighteen is patokos. It means those who have been made poor by the systems of society. That mm -hmm. text, Jesus meant he was speaking directly at the systems of domination. So, the miracles I believe Jesus would be involved in. Is the same is the miracle of galvanizing people and standing against systems of oppression, announcing to the oppressed that they have a right to stand up, they have they 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 should stand up, and he would be in action and in words challenging the system of oppression. Because actually, the miracles, if you look at it from a liberation theological standpoint, the miracles that Jesus worked were not just individual miracles, but his direct challenge to the systems that would allow people to die in the streets and to lay around without food and all mm -hmm. those kinds of things. It was a, it was it was it was a, it was creating a countercultural reality. Wow. Okay, so Andreas Kotze Kotze um, Kotezi, forgive me, Andreas, please. Um, I'm butchering your name, but he asked a really really great question. Um, Andres says, looking at our ever-shrinking global context, how do we connect and speak out against the bigger forces of oppression? What's happening in the U.S. with increased militarization of our police, the U.S.-Mexico border? We also see this in Palestine with the IDF. So how, what, what, how can you, do, you, do you understand the question? I, I got it. And okay. I would say, let, let me get, in, in the book of Acts, it says they started in Jerusalem, Hmm. Judea, Samaria, and the other most part. What I say to folk is, Montgomery allowed Dr. King eventually to have a platform to speak to the world because he first spoke to his own local context. So we have people sometimes who want to speak to the world, but they don't want to speak to the injustice in North Carolina. Well, they yeah. want to challenge the, the, the. They want to challenge what's happening globally, but they don't want to challenge a local legislature, legislator or a congressperson that's, that's backing all of this militarization. Mm -hmm. Movements come from the bottom up, hmm. from Montgomery up, from Birmingham up, um, um, from, from, right. from up. And so what we have to understand is the movements connect when we engage the movement. So for instance, I saw recently where some of the folk with um, uh, Philip Agnew, a good friend of mine, was in Palestine. Why, how did he get to Palestine? He had to start in Ferguson. He had to start in Florida. He had to start in the state capital of Florida. So mm -hmm. if, if you are engaged in a moral movement, those tributaries will begin to intersect. The analysis will begin. Dr. King was able to deliver his sermon at Riverside about violence in Vietnam because he stood on the platform of all of the organizing he, and, and engagement he had done. Mm -hmm. And then he was, able to, he was able to do an analysis, a prophetic analysis of how wrong it was for us to be in the war, not just because it was wrong, but also because of how it was impacting us at home. Mm -hmm. So I believe that your first goal is to start in your Jerusalem. Amen. Build these movements from the bottom up. Yeah. Wow, that's really good. And then you can actually, Andreas, you can actually see 
what's going on out there with eyes toward how it's impacting home home base. Uh, let me give you one example. I was oh, I've been recently invited to New Zealand, and the and the and the nephew of Gandhi came tomorrow Monday. We didn't have to go to India. We had to, wow. we simply had to stand up in North Carolina, and and it went out like a shot heard around the world. And the and the nephew of Gandhi was in a Marl Monday gathering and came up to me with tears in his eyes and said, "Thank you for continuing in that tradition." I'm telling you, there's power when wow. we were the prophets in the Bible were regional. They stood where they were, and if you stand where you were, your standing tall will be seen by many and will connect you with to many across the world. Amen. Okay, um, this is not our last question, but it's our second to last question. We're going to see if we can squeeze in one more here. So this, but I like this question. Um, given the language that you've used, fusion, coming together, how do you lift up specific characteristics of movements, for example, Black Lives Matter, without watering them down? Well, because we consider that on the front end. So for instance, in our uh, four years ago, when we put together our fourth piece, even before some of the shootings, we, we saw that the criminal justice system had been broken. Long before the, the cases we've seen now, it's broken in arresting, it's broken in, 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 in um, sentencing, it's broken in representa repre representation, uh, all of those areas. So, in, so from, from day one, when we had criminal justice persons come together and put together that plank of the agenda, we asked them to think broadly. And that's why they said we must fight for fairness in the criminal justice system as it relates to black, brown, and poor white people. Hmm. And, and we did not know how to unconnect them. That's the point. You have, if, if you believe black lives matter, you believe poor white lives matter. If you believe black lives matter, you believe all lives matter, and I don't believe there's anybody who believes from a moral perspective against injustice in the court will run if you happen in a particular moment to say, let's examine in the light of this what is happening as it relates to black people. Because whatever, piece, and this is another side, see, whatever law enforcement does, it's doing in your name. Yeah. When people shoot, they're shooting on your authority. Police are given their authority from the people. Mm -hmm. So we believe that actually, and, and the last thing, Lisa, our movement said from the day one, a true movement, particularly in the South, has to deal with race. Mm -hmm. And we struggle with that. Some people didn't want to deal with race. They said, oh, just deal. You can't. You can't. You have to deal with race. And particularly in a time where you have racism without racism. Where you have folk who have never used racial language, but but you must critique at a deep level the policies that are having a disparate impact on black and brown people. And and what we do at the movement, we have white people, Lisa, yeah. stand up and speak to the issues of race. Ah. It's not always black people. To see a moral movement says we're gonna break out of it. So sometimes I stand up and I speak about what's happening to white women when it comes to to, to voter ID and and the lack of Medicaid. And a white woman will get up and talk about how it's impacting black people because we're showing that we are fused. Wow, that is prophetic. I mean, that truly is prophetic in today's world because I think that what we have gotten into is we've gotten into a bunch of boxes. And I mean, I'm a guilty of this. I mean, I think. We, we, we think of what it looks like to be in, like, we have this term now that we use, white ally. And I recently heard one pastor say, I'm done using that, that term. And it was a black pastor who said, I'm done. And I didn't understand it at first, and then I got it. You know, when she ex described, she explained, uh, Tracy Blackman I'm from, from Ferguson, she explained that it was really just about the boxes. It's about the boxes that we're putting people in, and it's hemming people in, and it's not allowing them to actually be free and human and, and true, not just allies seeing themselves apart from the movement, but actually being in the movement. Like, this is actually their fight as much as it is my fight. Yeah, it's the fight for the soul of the country. What about being brothers yeah. and sisters? What about when I stood up for wow. LGBT rights? People said, why are you doing that? I said, because it's my sister. They said, you don't have a sister. I said, yeah, Nancy Petty, who's a white lesbian pastor, the pastor of Pulling Memorial, who was the first pastor to stand up for us when we were fighting resegregation in Raleigh. She's white and went to jail. We met. I didn't know she was lesbian. We met, and we became brother and sister. Later on, I found out. So, I, first of all, I'm for this issue, not politically. My sister is being impacted 
by this that's unconstitutional it. act. Wow. When she says, my brother is being impacted, that's deeper language. That's deeper language that we must get. And, we, and, and extremists, sometimes we succumb to the extreme. Like, for instance, Lisa, uh -huh. why is it that we use the language of the extremists to define them? Like, why do we call them right? Huh. Whoa. Okay. Break it when down. They're so wrong. Oh, you know what? You're. It <laughs> looks like you're. <laughs> when they're so wrong, it sounds like uh, your connection is is loose right now. You may want to just check your check your weakening connection. Of the, of, let me, Miss Turner. We have you. <laughs> okay. Can you can you speak? Let's see if we can still hear you. Okay, I think it's so, a power connection. We got about a, right. Okay, you got me. Okay, yeah, yeah. You're still on. You're still on. Don't worry. So, so well, that's that is so powerful. Let me just say that one thing that, that is striking to me about that is that what you're saying is that we are family, and you know, you know how like there's that old like I know this is true in the African American right. community, in the Black community. You know, you don't talk about my mama. You just don't do that. You don't talk right. about my mama because if you talk about right. my mama, they're gonna be a fight. There's going to be a fight because my mama is me, right? right? So in the same way, you don't talk about my brother, my sister, my right. family if you see them as family, not just an ally. And that's the difference in fusion as opposed to just writing down names on a piece of paper and say we have a coalition. Right. We've been working at this for seven straight years, long before people knew about Mar Monday, building relationships, being engaged, going to jail together, marching together, standing together, writing an agenda together, so that so that when we're fighting for these issues, as I said, and, and for me as a pastor, you know, I, when I when I'm fighting for health care, I'm thinking about that family in my church. Mm -hmm. that doesn't have health care. We did a poverty tour, went all over the state, went under bridges and in the woods and found people and met with them. So we deal with poverty issues. There are faces right in front of us. Yeah. You know, I was brought to uncontrollable tears in the woods in a place called Hickory when we went in to meet with people living in the woods, a white woman, a black woman, a Latino, a black man, a white man. And the white woman who had back problems, who had been middle class and all this stuff happened to her now living in the woods, offered me her seat in the middle of the woods hmm. and, and offered me some food, a piece of sandwich that we don't know where it came. And it broke me down. I said, how can we be letting our people live like this? She said to me, you may never see me again. They probably will run me out of the woods or arrest me. I'm asking you one thing. As you all fight, don't forget my name. Don't forget me. Mm -hmm. And fusion politics is about not just about fusing issues and ideas and, and organization, but restoring our humanity, coming yeah. back to who we yeah. are as human beings created for fellowship and saying that I am my brother and sister's keeper. It's not mm -hmm. just about being an ally. It's about how I want my brother or sister treated. But then, but then, Dr. Barber, how do we deal with the very real power politics, the power dynamics that happen in the everyday life of these organizations? It is the exact same thing that broke down the, the racial relations, even in the civil rights era. I mean, that is the thing that, that you know, that when, when SNCC said, I'm sorry, we got it. This is a black movement now. White folks got to go. Y'all are you know, challenging our leadership a little too much now. We can't have it. We have to have, we have to be able to exercise our power, our black power, even as we're fighting for our power. So how do we balance that, you know, even in the midst of this fusion movement? Am I am I taking you a little too no, far? No, oh no, <laughs> no. I think that families have struggled. Mine does. Okay. But one thing about it, enough pain will make your family come together. And I believe we're in enough pain in America right now in so many ways. As Dr. King said in the speech, um, uh, uh, when was that speech? It was um, in, in December 10th, 1967, where he talked about the meaning of hope. He opened. He said, "I'm worried about America," mm -hmm. and I'm worried about America. And if and if and if having an extreme agenda out there that is trying to sell America this poisonous idea that the way to a more perfect union is to deny public education, deny health care, deny immigrant rights, deny women's rights deny unemployment, deny minimum wage, deny living wages, deny earned income tax credit, uh, deny the president any assistance even when he's trying to do what's right for the country, yeah. spread all kinds of division, and then after you've created all this division, 
make sure everybody can get a gun easier than they can vote and deny the right. If that, that does not worry us enough to come together, then right. shame on us. There is a point at which it's not about theory. It's about, it's, it's about you, can these bones live? Can we come together? Can we put aside our organizational egos long enough? It may not last, you know, movements may not last 20 years. But can we not, for at least a period of time, understand the need to intersect all of these moments? And if we can't do that, then we, we cannot criticize the dividers if we accept the division ourselves. Amen. We're going to have to end it here. There was one more great question, and you know what I'll do is I'll ask it afterwards uh, on, the, on the Sojo action. And Dr. Barber, I'll ask you, and then I'll put your answer into Sojo Action on Twitter so that folks can actually hear it, okay? okay. Um, but let me just say thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, thank you, viewers, for, for tuning in. It's been an awesome hour. And, and thank you to Sojourners, Faith in Action. And here's the last little blurb, you know, put your faith into action. Join the Sojourners Faith in Action Leader Circle. And you can do that by emailing mobilizing at sojo.net. And don't forget that this is the, the leader circle actually gives you access. I'm seeing if you can see it there. Yeah, it gives you access to lots of great goodies um, at Sojourners, including discounts on stuff in our Sojo store, uh, the first dibs on asking questions at these hangouts. And also, we will give you a call and ask specifically if we need help in your area, your zip code, uh, whether it is uh, putting on a prayer vigil at a specific time, doing a news conference, doing a radio spot. If you let us know that you want to help out um, at a particular time, then we will give you a call. But you sign up at mobilizing at sojo.net. That's mobilizing at sojo.net. So God bless you all. Thank you so much again, Dr. Barber. And we will look forward to seeing you on the road. I know I'm going to see you on the road sometime soon. And we'll look forward to seeing you, Sojo viewers, um, the next time around. And in the meantime, God bless you and keep the faith. Amen.